Hi and welcome to Somatic Wise. This video is about eco-psychology and eco-therapy. What is it and why do we need it? So this is part one of a three-part series. Today's video is going to be a general introduction to eco-psychology and eco-therapy so that people can understand what they are and why they're so necessary in today's world. The next video after that will be about some fundamental concepts in the field, some foundational knowledge that we use as we go forward with this practice. And then the third video will be, well, what does it look like if we're doing ecotherapy? Some basic interventions, and there's so many because there's so many different types of eco-psychology. So here we go. As you probably already know, psychology is the Western science dealing with the study of people the human mind, our inner experience, and especially behaviors. Because humans are so complex, so is psychology. There's many different branches. Some deal with thoughts, some only deal with behaviors. Some deal with relationships or different parts of relationships like our attachments. There's psychotherapy, which aims for healing. There's group psychology, industrial psychology, sports psychology, all different types. For the most part, there's an, there's an attempt to understand and many times to move towards healing or becoming more whole. In practice, psychology, like many of the soft sciences, is not only a science in practice, it's also an art. So then eco-psychology is the branch of psychology that studies the human nature intersection, that space between us and human, or that space between us and nature, with emphasis on healing. So why is that important? Why do we need a whole branch of psychology just dealing with humans and nature? Well, it might be pretty obvious what I'm going to say next. And before I do, I just want to remind people that this video is intended to instill hope because eco-psychology is genuinely one of the very most hopeful things I personally have ever found in terms of helping humans heal and get past the slew of problems we've created. So the emphasis is on hope and finding our way through things that might have felt impassable before this. So please stay tuned. The first step in healing is facing the problem, right? The reason that we need eco-psychology is basically because we humans are destroying the planet's ability to support life, including but not limited to ours, our own human life. Now, the Earth's biosphere is a very thin and delicately balanced envelope that surrounds the entire sphere of the Earth. It consists of the Earth's magnetic field, which protects us from solar radiation, and it also consists of a thin envelope of gases, soil, and plants, and microbes. And we depend 100% on this to create and sustain life. We're not really able to destroy the magnetic field, because that comes from plate tectonics and geology, but the rest of the elements in that picture are kind of in trouble, actually really in trouble because of human behaviors. They're really suffering. We are collectively ruining the long-term ability of this planet to support life and mostly for short-term gains. Worst of all, we know we're doing it, or maybe even worse than that is that it's continuing to accelerate. Now, I think we can see where psychology comes into this picture, right? Mainstream psychology is just barely beginning to address this issue of a widespread, massive global problem of human behavior destroying the planet, even though human behavior is the purview of psychology. And if there's any science that really has the tools to solve this problem, it would be psychology. Because even though humans are complex and kind of unpredictable, for the most part, psychology has done a really good job at understanding us, our fundamentals, and what motivates us, what makes us go. Therapy has catalyzed massive healing and improvements in the lives of so many people, yet psychology has barely begun to address this problem. If you ask me what the biggest problem humanity faces today, I would say by far and away, it's our disconnection from and resulting lack of reverence for the natural world and all non-human life in it and for other humans as well. It's almost as though, no, it is as though collectively our neural circuits for empathy and interconnection, both for other humans and non-human life, have somehow become severely underdeveloped. This is literally the biggest problem in the world that we face today because the ongoing survival of life is the real bottom line, not money, life. That's the real bottom line. Again, if you ask me, 
this is my YouTube channel, so I get to say my opinion, I guess. I do find a lot of hope in the fact that many, 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 many people adore nature, adore animals, and are very upset at what's going on. We're going to talk about why we're not able to budget and just why, why we have not been able to budget to date in just a few minutes. I do find a lot of hope in the reverence and love that people find for nature and also many people are already experiencing the effects of climate change and habitat loss and so more people are becoming motivated to save our biosphere and re-nurture our ecosystems. And here's the thing, every bit of who we are, every cell in my body and your body comes from nature, it comes from earthy life processes. It, used to be part of the soil and plants and the molecules of water were in the ocean. We are inseparable from this planet and we know it. We are deeply wired to live in harmony and balance with our natural environment. We've just gone really astray, but there is a fundamental understanding within us how to get back and that is what we need to access. We love trees, we love animals, we love beauty, and we protect what we love. And, in fact, the secret to feeling better, both collectively and individually, is engaging in life-sustaining actions. Just like if you have a problem, it's a lot better to kind of gather yourself together and do something useful about it instead of just sitting there and either worrying about it or trying to repress it and pretend it's not happening. And indeed, with what's happening in our climate today, it's increasingly impossible to repress it and pretend that it's not happening and it's also all over the news so moving forward and taking life sustaining actions is a major major way out of this built up stress and fear eco anxiety that we have over environmental conditions today i would really invite anybody who's moved to to comment in the section below what do you do to sustain nature what actions do you take and that's the, one of the many beautiful things about eco-psychology is that there's so much room for individualism and creativity in finding what is best for you. Some people don't like to get their hands in the soil and so they might you know, take legal action and write their senator or join a lawsuit blocking the demolishment of an environmental law. There's so many ways to get involved. So all of this is why Dr. Andy Fisher talks about creating a psychology that's adequate to our time in history. That is addressing a massive global problem that's created by human behavior. Although this issue, which is very much related to everything we're talking about, it deserves its own treatment. And fortunately it is getting more of its own attention and treatment elsewhere throughout social media and other videos and works that people are putting out into the world. I will briefly note that it's impossible to disconnect the problem of destruction and oppression of the natural environment from the massive and painful problem of oppression and discrimination against other people, especially other people who have less power under current social and economic systems. And the link in these seemingly, at least on the surface, disparate issues is this. Exploitation and domination are the same mindset, whether it's point ag pointed against nature, other animals, or other more vulnerable people. The common theme is exploiting and sometimes destroying for individual or small group short-term gain. Unfortunately, the outcomes of this mindset are usually really bad, both for BIPOC, that is black indigenous people of color, and for ecosystems. And this disparity worsens as the climate change continues to intensify because competition for scarce resources is gonna increase, right? If somebody has less social and economic power, they're gonna feel the effects of climate change a lot faster and a lot more intensely, just as they have already felt the effects of all sorts of pollution and industrial issues much faster than people or a higher social economic status have felt. The bottom line is that we all need life on this earth to continue in order for there to be any healing between cultures or any reparations. Life is the bottom line. All of us need this to happen. The effects of cashing out natural resources are going to reach all of us eventually. 
just an example as to how it hits all of us eventually. Our current global pandemic of the novel coronavirus and COVID-19 are thought to literally originate from our cavalier and callous treatment of nature. It is believed to have originated from wet markets and it might as well have been any industrialized farming or area where there's an intense concentration of animals with all their biofluids and excretions without the checks and balances that happen in a natural ecosystem. Whether you believe it came from wet markets or whether you believe it came from a laboratory or wherever this virus came from, the conditions are still there so long as we keep mistreating animals and the ecosystems in this fashion. Because again, when you concentrate a lot of biomass, in a small area without the checks and balances and you have humans around, that's how it doesn't get stopped by the balance of the ecosystem and that's how it jumps to humans. And that's how we've already had a lot of pandemics. HIV was thought to start that way. I think uh, SARS, the bird flu, several of them. So epidemiologists have already warned us that they've noticed a lot of viruses are already out there the same prime to jump into human population. The thing is, is that we need to stop trashing the planet and the animals. And if we start to treat it with respect, that means supporting the ecosystems. That means that there's checks and balances in place. That means that we're not continuing to push into ecosystems that we haven't been in before, where these pathogens might be lurking in an animal base. And that's usually a better outcome for us. You can really start to see that when you look at things with an ecological lens, this is how it all weaves together. So no, we cannot afford to ignore the biosphere and what's going on in that as we're dealing with COVID-19. With respect to individual psychotherapy and ecological lens is also needed in today's times because when people in the helping profession don't respond to the ecologically based pain that clients bring in, they're missing a major source of anxiety, depression, stuckness, stress. It's here, it's in the news every day. People are coming in with this. Sometimes it's unaware, it's churning in the background, contributing to their overall stress. We all know about it. We've all seen horrible news reports. Sometimes it's up in the front of people's minds. And so if we don't address it, we're not helping people adapt to current circumstances and that adaptation is what's gonna help us move forward. We're ignoring a source of stuckness. Also, if we minimize it and say things like, oh, it won't happen in your lifetime, that's gaslighting. The UN is saying it's gonna happen within the next 12 years. And for people in my home state of California, our state is on fire. It's worse than it's ever been. It's already happening. So as a profession, we can't ignore this source of pain that people are coming in with. We're threatening to not help the client nearly as much as we could or lose them entirely because nobody likes their concerns being dismissed. Uh, and it's painful to look at. It can be our own denial. It's horrifying, which is why it's easy to just sort of label it as individual pathology. And the thing is, is that when our gorgeous, beautiful jewel of an earth that we live in and everything in it is being threatened, it's not pathology to be anxious or upset about it. It is normal. It is our normal alarm systems going off and saying, do something, do something, please do something. So as people entrusted with public mental health and well-being of individuals and groups and families that come to see us, we must attend to this and we must have the training to know how to do so properly. I will add that these concerns are hitting everybody across the board. They're particularly prominent in the younger generation who are seeing a future 50, 60, 70 years in the future being impacted by habitat loss and climate change. It's also very prominent in the minds of people who have experienced ecological disasters so those are especially important to have in mind when you work with people who might be coming from these populations. So having just touched on the surface of these problems that are often unmentionable and not usually brought into conventional therapy rooms, now we're moving into the hopeful part of this video. Eco-psychology is specifically designed to understand and heal this rift, this disconnection between us and our natural world. 
and all of its terrible effects. Eco-psychology draws on the fact that deep in our bones we know we came from this beautiful planet, that our molecules are just part of this life cycle, that we belong here and that we love this place, and we, we need to save it. We need to stop the behaviors that are threatening it. And that living our lives in a constant state of stress and overwhelm is not a normal state and we should not be settling for this. So why are we so stuck then? Well, Dr. Andy Fisher, again, and he's got a wonderful book, and I will link it in the uh, video description below. He provides some insight as to why humans might be gobbling up the Earth's resources like an out-of-control swarm of locusts or something. He talks about the exact same thing that we see all the time in somatic psychotherapies. So we all have pain, right, and in wounds current and in our past and healing means that you have to be able to face pain feel it and allow it to move through you however collectively in modern societies we have a lot of it but we're not really getting the support that we need to move through it see here i am in this catastrophic year of 2020 saying wait a minute in order to heal we need to stop and feel our pain and you might be saying but Andrea, that's all I've been doing recently is feeling pain. There's no way I can turn within and look at more. And you would be absolutely right. I mean, I'm not here to say who's right and wrong. Everybody's inner experiences need to be heard and validated. In order to heal this, we must face it. But the situation and circumstances that we're in these days is making that incredibly difficult. In order to heal wounding, people must have a sense of life's goodness, a felt sense experience of deep connection and support, a grounding, a counterbalance to the trauma, or as I often call it, a wind in our sails. If you don't have wind in your sails, the boat's not going anywhere. You have to have the time, the energy, the basic good physical health and willingness to go within and face it. because. This does draw on our resources, and that's why we say in somatic psychotherapy, we don't do deep work right after somebody's had a surgery or if they're in the midst of an illness. So you have to have energy and, and all those resources available to you to really face deeper problems, right? And where are we gonna get this nowadays? Our current social, cultural, and economic circumstances just are not providing that for many people, if not most people. The current circumstances of many people's lives today are too stressful and demanding, with the dollar being the bottom line. And if you don't have enough of that dollar, you don't eat or you don't have a place to live. And so that contributes to isolation, acting out. When we're constantly in survival mode, we can't soften and feel empathy, which is exactly the issue that I was just talking about a few minutes ago. When our nervous systems are whipped up into this terrible state, it, we just don't have it within us to soften and start to not only feel connection with other people, but to chew through the backlog that all of us individually and collectively are tending to create these days. Basically, if we're too distressed to do anything about it, then we're not going to do anything about it. So then how do we get ourselves out of this mess, right? I'm trying to make a video showing how eco-psychology is useful. Well, the good news is, is that we have some starting points for that about feeling better. It's a very complex subject and there's no way we can address it all in a video, a YouTube video that's probably going too long as it is. The reason people usually don't start in fixing environmental problems or even dealing with our own problems is that we just don't know where to start. Okay, so let's talk about where we can start to and I'm kind of interweaving individual and societal problems here. At this point, I'm talking about eco-psychology, how it's helpful, and how we can get wind in our sails. So, because the cool thing about it is that in eco-psychology, we nurture ourselves, we're also nurturing other people, and depending on where, where we point our energy, we're also nurturing the planet all at once. It's really cool. So Joanna Macy has a wonderful model for this. She's been around since doing this since at least the 1960s. She's developed a four part model that she calls the spiral and it's made for the general public, not just for healing professionals. I'd really encourage you to look it up. I can post some links in the description below. All you have to do is search for Joanna Macy and the spiral and that's what comes up. 
And the spiral is a four part model where you keep passing through the same boop, 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 four points over and over again. Each time you get higher and higher, that's, or more better at it. I guess that's the model of the spiral. And she starts with gratitude because she's recognizing in her construction of this model that people don't move forward because they can't or they don't have the wind in their sails. So even though it feels like everything's going, you know, where in a handbasket these days, most of us have something that we can slow down and touch into that feels good, that we're grateful for. Just slowing down, saying, hold on to all the problems for a minute and just grounding ourselves. What are you grateful for today? Therapy, of course, is another very good thing to help with stabilizing us and working with pain, a backlog of it, especially somatic psychotherapy because it gets right to the heart of where this stuff lives in our nervous system. I've got some other videos on that. And because all good somatic psychotherapy that I'm aware of begins with the stabilization phase. So you don't face the pain unless it's in your window of tolerance, which is what's manageable. And good trauma therapy eventually expands our window of tolerance so that we can handle more without it being a strain. Um, somatic psychotherapy is slowly but surely becoming more available to more people, especially with the BLM movement. People are really starting to realize that there's many, many people in this world who need access to these therapies and as I'm recording this, there's more things being put in place, so that's more available. There's also sliding scale and community uh, agencies are offering therapy. Um, I've got a resource page for Southern California on my website if you want to check that out. More points about where to start feeling better so that one can stabilize oneself and if one is motivated to start working towards uh, the world's problems, then that would give us the wind in our sails to do so. Spiritual practice can be very effective at providing the motivation and foundation we need to address our own problems, our family's issues, our community. It gives us sort of a bedrock just to fall back on, feel like we're connected to something, something or someone's got our back. And in upcoming videos, like I mentioned, I'll be talking about specific practices of eco-psychology, which again, usually start with touching into nature. At this point, as we're starting to wrap up this video, I cannot go a minute farther without discussing the real star of the show, and that's nature herself. For many of us, having a consistent and active nature connection is hugely important. And there are so many different ways to engage with and enjoy nature in ways that don't harm it. Nature in its various forms is deeply enjoyable and regulating for most people, so it usually feels very good to engage in ecotherapy. And again, we'll look at some various ways that we do that in upcoming videos. I always ask my clients what makes them happy, because again, that's, believe it or not, that's a foundation of trauma therapy. You have to touch into the goodness, the sense of joy of being afforded the, the opportunity of being alive in this life. You have to feel that felt sense goodness. And by far and away, the most common answer I get when I ask this question involves some form of experiences with nature, including with animals, whether it's animals that live with a client or animals we've run across in nature at some point. Far and away, what lights you up inside? It's nature. Nature is so good at producing experiences of tremendous wonder, awe, joy, peacefulness, a good sense of being alive, which we desperately need in difficult times and to take difficult actions. We need such foundations to help put our battered selves back together and then the rest of the planet. When people restore their nature connection in the way that works for that individual, they soften inside. The chronic bracing and jaw clenching can ease and go away. A sense of rushing slows down. We can feel ourselves again in the present moment. Being together in nature also promotes a sense of deep bonding and connection with other people. That's why they created Outward Bound and other wilderness therapeutic programs, because people connect and bond better when they're in natural settings. The problem of exploitation of other people and ecosystems tend to diminish. The sense of isolation decreases. People tend to experience more interconnection and a deep desire to cherish and protect each other and nature, so we protect what we love. So being in and caring for nature goes hand in hand with community building and community building is super important 
in reducing all the acting out behaviors, including those which are known as crime, because you have a strong network, a social context for people. It's important to note here that many people in inner cities have very little means of contact with nature and its life-changing qualities, and we do need to address that as a society and make more opportunities available economically in terms of transportation and integrating more nature into our cities. Now, Andrea, you might say, this sounds really pie in the sky. Are you saying that just making our connection with nature better is going to cure all of our problems? No, that's not what I'm saying. I will say that the effects of nature connection are incredibly reliable, strong, and consistent. There's a huge body of literature out there about this. Just look it up. I remember one study that I saw not too long ago. They had a control group and a group of people who just looked at a picture of trees, a picture, and their blood pressure dropped. Imagine if they were out there in the trees. The science behind eco-psychology is pretty robust. I think there's some sites out there that summarize literature. It is a good starting point. It is a really good starting point. It's not a cure-all, but it's a needed foundation for the work of healing our planet. We, as in humanity, can absolutely do this. There are many, many people who care deeply about these issues, and yes, we can make things better. Don't let anyone tell you it's not possible for us to make things better than they are now, because it absolutely is possible. All it requires is the consistent willingness to try. In our next video, we will discuss foundational concepts of eco-psychology. As for this video, I invite you to share your comments about your reactions or questions regarding this material, about your own experience, and I especially invite comments from those who have already experienced the effects of climate change, such as the California wildfires or anything else similarly that you'd like to talk about. Until next time, do take care and remember to look for that which nurtures and heals you. Thanks again for watching SomaticWise. If you hit the like button, shared this video, subscribe to my channel, or even consider contributing to my Patreon account, then that would help me continue getting this information and similar stuff out into the world. But in any case, do take care, and I hope you learned something good.